Welcome back to our study in the book of Hebrews. And if it's your first time, welcome here. Um, this is a place to really study in depth of God's word. Uh, we're going through some homework from Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa's women's ministry, but we're also doing this in depth teaching of Hebrews. We are now in Hebrews chapter seven. We're gonna be covering verses 18 through 28 today. Last week, I really enjoyed covering, or really I should say uncovering, some of the mysteries concerning King and High Priest Melchizedek. Um, if you happen to have missed that, it, I really encourage you to go back and watch the video. It was just a really um, amazing teaching, not because of my teaching good, but what God's Word had to say. It's very revealing and important. So I encourage you, you can go to my YouTube, uh, um, which is Upward Call. Um, that's U-P-W-O-R-D-C-A-L-L. -L, or you can go to Calvary Chapel Meridian's YouTube and you will find it there as well. So all the Hebrews teachings are on both of those channels. So I encourage you to do that. Well, the writer of Hebrews, which ultimately we know is the Holy Spirit writing through a, a man, uh, this inspired word. This writer is not finished uh, with his message about Jesus and Melchizedek, especially when it, uh, it emphasizes Jesus' superiority as priest. And we're going to see this in three particular ways. So when you see these scriptures come up, um, pay attention. They're important. Number one is the surety of a better covenant. Number two is savior to the utmost. And number three is separate from sinners. Those are very important part of Christ's priesthood. Now, I've come to view the author of this book uh, like a lawyer. A lawyer. He is a man that had to have handled the law <laughs> in Judaism. The way he writes is really stupendous in that way and so full of knowledge. But on the other hand, he reminds me of a lawyer in a court um, case arguing point by point. And he uh, clarifies the legitimacy of the superiority of Jesus Christ as high priest above the Levitical order. First from this angle, then from that angle. And he builds his case appealing to the jury and in this case, we look at the book of Hebrews, it was written to this community of uh, believers that were Jewish in descent and uh, in religion. And so he's arguing and appealing to these Hebrews to agree with the Holy Spirit's truth that the Levitical um, system was imperfect. Because it was flawed, it had to be annulled and replaced with something better. And this was always in God's plan. It was always in his view. So I've broken up our passage into uh, four short segments. Number one will be draw near to God. Number two, surety of a better covenant. Number three, Jesus lives to make intercession. And number four, Jesus, the perfect high priest. Let's bow our heads and ask God to give us understanding and speak to us personally. This is your word, God. It's to us so that we can know you, love you, serve you, walk with you, and we can prepare ourselves for heaven where we'll be with you for eternity. So we need you to give us understanding of it. We pray your Holy Spirit would teach us, enlighten our eyes, help us to take those personal parts to heart, Lord, so that we're able to uh, live as uh, Christ followers, imitators of Christ. So speak to us in that personal way. We give this study to you and ask that you would lead it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to begin with a section one, Draw Near to God. This is going to be verses 18 um, and 19. So read with me. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment or the law because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Well, the law could not make a perfect atonement for sin nor could it make people perfectly holy or righteous. It could neither justify nor sanctify, which means it could not bring a person to eternal life or salvation. Therefore, 
It must be annulled, the scripture is saying. It must be replaced to fulfill God's ultimate plan. And his ultimate plan and design for people is to make it possible for them to have a personal access to the presence of God and intimate fellowship with him. That's bringing, bringing in of a better hope that we could draw near to God. That was his plan all along. And so verse 19b says, On the other hand, there is the bringing on in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. The Jews and Gentiles needed a better hope than the Arianic priesthood, a priest of a different order, which was, it's always been God's intention, like I said. It's always been his plan. God planted hope in the scriptures. Um, if only we would search them, if only we would open our eyes to them. From the Garden of Eden, when God killed an animal to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve because of their sin, to Melchizedek's little story, which is a type of Christ, tucked away in the Bible, to the Levitical order of priesthood and the sacrifices of rams and bulls, all of these and so many more um, point to Jesus. They point that he was always the hope of salvation. The Jews always had a Messiah they were looking for, and Jesus is that Messiah. Only he could accomplish what the Levitical priesthood and the law could never do, draw us near to God. Drawing near to God is the essence of Christianity. It's the sweetness of Christianity, if you ask me. It's the fullest expression of our faith um, that we can have when we enter into his presence, into the Holy of Holies, with nothing between us and God. That is something that Judaism could never accomplish nor religion or any other belief system. But are you drawing near to God? Are you experiencing his presence? Are you daily involved in seeking him, listening for him, talking to him, you know, really experiencing um, the purpose of Christ dying on the cross, that the 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 uh, veil could be rent, it could be torn, so we could just enter in boldly. If not, why not? God is available to you 24-7. Many Christians settle for a detached relationship with Jesus. That relationship is characterized by like distance, a mediocre connection, a lack of commitment to that connection. A one-way conversation when a relationship, any relationship, <laughs> it naturally calls for two-way communication. Both sides speaking, listening, and responding. God always does his part. He speaks, he listens, he responds. But are we speaking to him regularly? Are we listening for him, both through the Holy Spirit and the scriptures. Are we responding? Are we reacting? Are we doing what it is we need to do from the conversations, from the takeaways? God always does his part, as I said, but do we do our part? Often um, this, this distant relationship that Christians maintain with the Lord, um, they tend to resist the voice of the Holy Spirit when he comes, call, knock, comes calling upon their heart. And often there's a little depth of study of scripture, which is the primary way God speaks to us. So scripture is invaluable in our relationship with God. Christians who have, you know, Jesus living in their hearts go day after day without making Christ, uh, Christ's life much of a difference in their own life. And this is not how Christianity is meant to look, friends. How has it been that Christian or Christ followers have come to settle for so little of Jesus, such a meager taste of him, when um, the life of Christ is so indispensable to us? I heard a story once of a man falling from a great height, plummeting, plummeting, plummeting to the ground, to his death. But he cried out to God. He cried out to God, God, save me. And God heard, and glory be, if he didn't land in a tree. He landed in the tree, and the tree broke his fall. And he looks up to the heavens and says, Thanks, God. I've got it from here. 
are we living a, I've got it from here, Christianity. You've brought me this far, but I've got it from here. I can figure this life out. I can do it on my own. You know, only crying out in our most desperate times, not spending time with him or acknowledging that his presence with, is with us constantly. In John 15, 4 and 5, Jesus said, Abide in me, meaning remain in relationship with me. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, remember, remains in relationship with me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You need to remain connected with your source of strength and power to endure trials and overcome temptations. You need to stay in union with Jesus to obtain wisdom and guidance and truth to navigate this life. That's something we need every day. You need to look to Jesus heart to heart, face to face, to be partakers of his marvelous comfort, his peace, his love, which he longs to pour into your heart. It's a relationship. It's not the law. It's not the rules. It's not the regulations. It's a relationship. Jesus died for it. He asks you to live for it. I not only preach to you, I want to make this so clear. I do not come into his presence nearly as much as I need to. I never come in as not as much as I need to. And I'm grateful for scriptures like these and messages that inspire me to draw close to him and seek him more. I hope you feel that way. The theme drawing near to God puts me into mind of a little book called The Practice of or the practice of the presence of God. The book is a compilation of writings and thoughts uh, from Brother Lawrence. He was a lay brother in the uh, Carmelite uh, monastery in Paris in the 1600s. So this is an old treasure. Uh, he served the Lord humbly, being assigned to work in the kitchen. I feel that I have had that calling for many, many years, assigned to work in the kitchen. How about you? <laughs> Well, it was said that amidst the tedious um, chores of cooking and cleaning, he was also at the constant bidding of his superiors. His tremendous desire to know God and to enjoy his presence led him to develop a rule of spirituality um, and work and how he would, you know, stay close to God while he worked. I related to Brother Lawrence at the time when I read this because I was a wife and a homemaker and I was keeping up with two littles and I was also in God's service. So I was managing many things. At the same time, I really wanted to know God and I wanted to grow. I had so much growing to do as I do now. So it, this was really a challenge in life. I mean, you can't just stop your life to accomplish drawing near to God. We do have to maintain our lives, don't we? So how do we incorporate drawing near to God with it? So Brother Lawrence wrote of, um, of remaining in consciousness of the presence of God while living everyday life at home or at work and doing um, all we could to please God. So his writings made a lifelong impression upon my intimacy with Christ. So I thought I would share just a few plum quotes with you from Brother Lawrence about drawing near to God. That we should establish ourselves in the sense of God's presence by continually conversing with him. We should put our life in our we should put our life in our faith by continually giving ourselves utterly to God in pure in abandonment in temporal and spiritual matters alike and find contentment in doing um, his will whether he takes us through sufferings or consolations. He said, let us occupy ourselves entirely in knowing God. The more we know him, the more we will desire to know him. As love increases with knowledge, the more we know him, the more we will truly love him. We will learn to love him equally in times of distress and in times of great joy. Think often on God. 
by day and by night, in your business and even in your diversions. Um, that's just the time you're taking apart when you're not working. He is always near you and with you. Leave him not alone. I love that. We need only to recognize God's God intimately present with us. So let me say that again. We need only to recognize God intimately present with us to address ourselves to him every moment, to recognize he is present at every single moment. So we could engage with him at any time, right? We um, have to know someone before we can truly love him. To know God, we must think about him often. Once we get to know him, as we think about him even more often, because where our treasure is, there our heart is also. When you find that God is not often in your thoughts, it's because he's, he's no longer your treasure. The things you must do, the things that occupy your life, your goals, your dreams, your work, um, your responsibilities, these things that occupy you can actually take over the throne of our heart, you know? We can be Christians and born again Christians, but we can put Jesus off to the side very readily. And so this, this opportunity to draw near that's been made through a great sacrifice through Jesus can be squandered. It can be wasted when we don't take advantage of it. Are you actively pursuing God, being mindful of his presence, inviting him into your everyday life? These are my words. Keeping a two-way conversation going. Or is that exchange been shut down for hours on end or even days? Psalm 72, 28 says, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I pray that you will give that some thought and prayer and consider inviting God's presence into your life more frequently by opening conversation with him. Talk to him. You can talk to him right up here without a single person ever knowing. You can carry on a conversation. Or you can include him when you're doing your dishes. You can include him by singing praise. You can include him by praying to him. But you can just talk to him. You can ask him questions, you know. But then stop and listen. Listen to his answers. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Open up the scriptures and say, I want to know you. Reveal who you are to me as I study. And God will. He wants to be known. Okay, number two, surety of a better covenant. Verses 20 through 22. Let's read them. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and he will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We've heard that a few times, haven't we? Verse 22 says, By so much more Jesus has become a surety um, of a better covenant. Verse 20 was written a little confusingly to our English language. Um, if It's written in the negative. So if we were to write it in the positive tone, it would be in so much as he was not made, or I think this is the way it's written now, and in as much as he was not made a priest without an oath, the positive would be God made him a priest by an oath. God made him a priest by an oath. Now, verse 21 is a parenthesis. It's inserted for explanation. It explains that God never swore an oath to for Aaron um, to substantiate the Levitical priesthood uh, that it would last forever. That oath was never given to them. There was never a promise that it would last forever, as God did for Jesus. The oath from Psalm 110.4 is quoted again. The Lord has sworn and will not relent that you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, verse 22 and verse 20 are connected. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Surety means under good security, guarantee, pledge. It also has the idea of permanency. A surety is 
and this is my definition to make it simple, um, a surety is similar to having a co-signer on a loan. If I am not fully trusted or qualified to pay a loan, and it's a high risk that I will fully be able to pay it, I will need a co-signer, someone with excellent credit, who's authorized to pay the loan if I default in some way. So God the Father uh, made a covenant um, about our salvation uh, with Jesus as the co-signer. Because of this, we are secure in our salvation. Uh, God doesn't need to do this because God is words enough, but he is you know, doubling up here in a way to, to show us how concrete our salvation is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as we have studied, the first covenant covered sins uh, through animal sacrifices, but it did not altogether remove sin. Um, it was temporary. The new covenant with Jesus Christ provides permanent forgiveness of sins through justification as if it had never happened at all, that all of our sins are forgiven. And the surety of Christ's covenant is based on, an et it has an eternal nature. That's very important. It covers us forever. You are a priest forever. When God makes an oath, it is a guaranteed thing. It's permanent. Jesus is the guarantee that our covenant with God will never be breached. What does that mean to you as a believer? Well, your debt of sin is forever stamped, paid in full. You cannot lose your salvation. That's what I think that means. Not as long as Jesus is your surety. What better covenant could there possibly be than this? All right, section three, Jesus lives to make intercession. Verses 23 through 25, I'm going to go through these verse by verse. Verse 23, also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. And as we've mentioned before, being merely human men, a Levitical priest could only serve for a manner of time because eventually he would die. Verse 24, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So what if the Jews had a wonderful high priest for a time who carried the people in his heart, he loved them, he prayed for them, he was their intercessor. How wonderful it would be to have that high priest. But what if for some reason he changed? What if his heart was different? What if his attitude became different in some way? Men are changeable, unlike Jesus Christ. Well, that becomes a very sad situation. Well, also, what about if he dies? What if the next in line, which would be a son, because they inherit the priesthood, what if the son who takes his place um, is not so wonderful, caring, prayerful? It's such a loss. We can relate to that. In a way, when we think about a beloved pastor that we might have, when he must move away or he retires or he dies, um, it's such a tragic loss for a church, especially when the next replacement is not as faithful and loving as he. But these are not issues that us as Christians deal with because our high priest never dies. He never changes. And the primary meaning here about being an unchangeable priest means that he will never have a successor. He will never be replaced. So he has an unchanging priesthood. Verse 25, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Because Jesus has an eternal unchanging priesthood, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. Um, so I love the word uttermost because it speaks of a great extreme. It means that he can bring us to salvation entirely, completely, to the furthest degree possible. Jude 124 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Ah, oh, that makes me look forward to heaven. My sins will be covered and I will be received with joy. And so will you. 
The law could not save you. The Levitical priesthood could not save you. They couldn't save the Hebrew Christians as well. They had to make a change. They had to release the law and the priesthood in order to receive the fullness of God's grace for them. Jesus can save you from your sins to the utmost degree. As someone has once said, from the guttermost to the uttermost. Verse 25. He is able to save you from the uttermost, those who come to God through him. And there's three parts to this verse. He is able to save to the uttermost is one, and those who come to God through him is part two. Jesus saves us from sin with its terrible consequences, the, the guilt, the shame, the curse, the slavery of Satan, the wrath of God and hell. Jesus saves us from all these, these things. But there is a severe caveat to this proclamation. You must come to God through Jesus. Through Jesus. And I mean the Jesus of the Bible. There's no way, other way to obtain salvation. Not even one. Not through law. Not through the law. Not through animal sacrifice. Not through good deeds or sacrifices like selling everything you have to the poor or crawling miles on your knees, not by lighting a candle or then saying a prayer, and certainly not by somebody being baptized for you after you die. That will not save you. Not through false Jesuses who are not in the Bible, like a Jesus who's Satan's brother or a Jesus that God the Father created. Nope, Father didn't create Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. That's the Godhead nor a Jesus who's merely an example of light to those who want to practice a spiritual light. Nope, that's not the Jesus that saves you. Nor a Jesus that is limited to being a prophet or a mere teacher or a long hairdo who might be have cool vibes that you dig to hang out with, you know. He's so cool, Jesus is. These are not the Jesus of the Bible, and these Jesuses will not save you. There is one way to salvation. John 10, 1 through 9 spoke of this. Um, it's a wonderful parable that Jesus spoke. And so I'm going to read this to you, John 10, 1 through 9. You can stop and turn there if you'd like. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as the thief and a robber. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings them out, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. But Jesus used this illustration. And they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. This is verse 7. So Jesus said to them again, Most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Let me break this down for you. The sheepfold was an enclosure. This is literally what a sheepfold is. It's made in a field where the sheep were collected by night to defend them. It was a safe place for them. Defended them from robbers, wolves, um, etc. And the shepherd was with them. The sheepfold represents salvation. Jesus is the door of the sheepfold. He's the only entrance for sheep to receive salvation. The sheep are true believers and followers of Jesus. Jesus is also the shepherd who keeps the sheep and guards the sheep, protects the sheep. He keeps them. Thieves and robbers are those who would attack and harm the sheep. They re represent any fraudulent avenue, belief system, religion, <laughs> to would try to say you go enter through them to receive salvation. John 14, 6 makes this very plain. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As high priest, 
Jesus makes intercession for us. Let's look at that third part of verse 25. Since he always lives to make intercession for us. As a high priest, Jesus makes intercession for you. And intercession is an act of the mediator. It's that Jesus who stands between God and man and man and God. He's the link between. So he stands as an advocate for us. He pleads for his children, claiming their justification as a matter of right on the grounds of his righteousness, his blood. Romans 8, 20, uh, Romans 8, 33 and 34 says, Who dare accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Here, Jesus is pictured pleading, praying, and defending us through his intercession against every charge of condemnation brought against us by the enemy. We know that he's the accuser of the brethren, isn't he? So by the enemy, by the world, or even by our own flesh or conscience that tells us you're not saved, you're not worthy, these weird condemnations that come, you're a failure, God will never accept you, um, or he'll never receive you back again. When you're a born-again Christian, those are just lies. And he's in heaven, he's pleading, he's praying that our faith will not fail, that we'll continue walking on with him. Um, and his ongoing priestly ministry in heaven, he intercedes for us in these ways. Therefore, our salvation is secure. So we've gone through three segments already. We are in segment four, Jesus, the perfect high priest. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has brought, become higher. He has become higher than the heavens. Jesus was fitting or suitable to be our high priest because he was of holy perfection. His character was perfection, without a flaw, without a mark, without a mar, spotless, stainless, perfect. And so because he had holy perfection and no one else ever has, he could save sinners and bring them into the presence of God. It says that Jesus was holy. Let me define these holy, harmless, defiled, separate from sinners for you. He was holy, uh, undefiled by sin, free from wickedness, observing every moral obligation, harmless, innocent without deception, free from guilt. Jesus is the only one who has ever lived on earth that never in any way did wrong to another. The only one. Undefiled means he has never entertained or was involved in any improper desire or passion. He was unstained by wrongdoing, misconduct, or law-breaking. He lived unspotted in the world. And then separate from sinners. This was an important portion. He did not approve of sin, nor did he partake in sin with them. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, Therefore, come out from among you believers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. He never touched the filth of this world. He came to heal it. <laughs> he came to forgive it, but he never was a partaker of it. He was a partaker in hum being human, but he never succumbed to sin. And then lastly, and has become higher than the heavens. Jesus is exalted in heaven to the Father's right hand, where he intercedes for us unhindered by a flawed character. The Levitical priest, they had a flawed character, but Jesus could intervene and with a perfectly unflawed character and with no earthly cares whatsoever. The human sinful little the Levitical priest, they served as best they could, but they could never in the perfection of the holiness of Christ. They could never beat that. So for context um, of the last two verses, verses 26 through 28, 
I'm going to read all of them again together so that it makes clear sense. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Verse 27, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once for all, this he, and that's speaking of Jesus, did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Jesus was sinless. We know that he had made a once for all offering for sin. He was that offering. Um, he that, that makes him, you know, superior to the Levitical priest who were men who repeatedly had to offer sacrifices for them, their own sins. That was never necessary for Jesus being perfectly holy. The law appointed high priests who were, you know, had weaknesses. They were, they were weak. They were, um, you know, um, easily stumbled by sin as we are. They're frail uh, and they, they're dying humans. They don't live forever. But on the contrary, the son had been perfected forever. So he's far superior in uh, character to the earthly priests. Only Jesus was worthy of the appointment of high priest. His perfection sealed it. His eternal nature justified it. And God's oath demanded it. Psalm 110.4, the Lord is a sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So one last note. God's oath in Psalms here uh, to appoint Jesus as high priest overrides the former designation of Levites. That's very important. It, uh, the Levites were appointed much further back, and then comes the psalm that was spoken, and it was a prophesy speaking of Jesus Christ coming in the, as the order of Melchizedek as a priest forever. And so that that prophecy overrides the designation of the Levites. Now, to wrap this up, we cover four areas. One, draw near to God. The veil is torn. Invite Jesus in to your your life. Invite him to be you know present. Be aware of his presence and speak to him. Talk to him. Pray to him. Let him be in all of your moments, whether they're sweet and joyful, whether they're challenging and hard. At any time, call upon the name of the Lord. He loves you, um, and he wants to have a two-way conversation with you. So open up the conversation and never let it close. Number two, surety of a better covenant. The new covenant in Christ provides permanent forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the guarantee um, that our covenant with God can never be breached. Because of Jesus, your debt of sin is forgiven, stamped, paid in full. And then number three, Jesus lives to make intercession. Jesus prays for you. I remember one time when I was in tremendous spiritual pressure um, from the outside and the inside. And I mean, I didn't even mean to pray this. It just literally came out of my mouth. I said, Jesus, pray for me. It was like I had this eternal moment where I could really see that he was interceding. I wasn't alone in it, but I actually prayed that prayer uh, because I needed him so desperately. And let me tell you, he showed up, of course, Oh, he's he's really righted all my wrongs and given me hope in the hardest places. So I thank God that he's interceding for you and for me even now. And so because he intercedes for us as high priest, your sins will never condemn you. And then number four, Jesus, the perfect high priest, um, no religion, no philosophy, no worldview or a person can get you to heaven. Only one is worthy. Only one is able. He is the way. He is the door. He is the high priest of your faith, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just, I love these verses that speak of your greatness, your perfection, that you're high and above anything or anyone else that might want to try to be a door for my salvation. None of them 
work. They all fail. They fall short. Trying to live in the law falls short. Trying to be good falls short. False Jesus' fall short, but you are the real thing. We honor you. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you that you would want to be the surety of our salvation. We thank you that we can have peace in our salvation based on this, the scriptures, Lord, in believing in Jesus. Um, I pray that you would continue to take this message to our hearts and make it personal. Touch our hearts by the Holy Spirit of what you want to do in us personally through this passage. We offer ourselves to you. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. See you here again next week. Bye for now.